Now, last week, it was pretty quick, a little bit rushed, because like I said, got sidetracked of time. But what I did want us to do was, last week, I wanted to go that way, but I didn't want to go so fast. I just wanted us to get used to all the, the items and the, uh, the furniture that was in the sanctuary. I want us to get an idea of what the sanctuary was. So we're going to review that today uh, when it comes up, because the sanctuary is such a very important topic. And I believe that every Christian, every Christian should know about the sanctuary. Why should every Christian know about the sanctuary? Because we, we went over that last week. There's a verse that says in there, thy way is in the sanctuary, O Lord. God's way is in the sanctuary. And the sanctuary is literally like a, however you want to picture it, it's, a, it's like a diagram or a map showing us the plan of salvation. That is all the sanctuary is. So your journey with God is literally a walk through the sanctuary. Uh, the computer is, uh, we're still waiting for the upload. Is it, is it? <laughs> Okay, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, 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 that's in there. Anybody for having internet trouble? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so you need to need to take it. Oh, that's great. Back to no internet. Yep. It's right here. I don't know why. It just went. There you go. I don't know why. There you go. There you go. Try to be as quick as possible. That's great. Yeah, ask, it's asking me for my, uh, yep. Okay. All right, again, we're gonna be talking about the sanctuary. Purpose of the sanctuary, Exodus 25, eight, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. The whole purpose, as I said before, of the sanctuary was that so God can dwell among his people. Now, we know the children of Israel in those days were the chosen nation to be a beacon to the world. They were supposed to be a light to the world. At some point, as we study later on, they lost completely sight of their whole purpose. So when a lot of people come and they say, oh, no, the sanctuary was just for the Jews or just for Israel. No, that's not true. It's not true. That was not the purpose of the sanctuary. The purpose of the sanctuary was so that God can show man his plan of salvation. And that's what we're going to talk about. Answer, God wants to live among his people. God wants to live among his people. A brief description of the sanctuary as we went over it before. The original sanctuary was allegiant, tent type structure, 15 feet by 45 feet, based on an inch cubit, in which the presence of God dwelt. And special services was conducted. The walls were made of upright wooden boards set in silver sockets and overlaid with gold. The roof was made of four coverings, linen, goat hair, ram skin, and badger skin. It had two rooms, the holy place and the most holy place. A thick heavy veil curtain separated the rooms. The courtyard, the area around the sanctuary was 75 feet by 150 feet. It was fenced with fine linen, clothes supported by 60 pillars of brass. So this is just a description of just how the sanctuary looked. And we can get a photo right here. 
uh, I, as we said last week, someone pointed out, but Gary is not here today. The sanctuary had a roof. It did have a roof. The only way it's opening because the, the person who made this design just wanted us to get a look up to how it looked. You had the outer court, you have the holy place, and then you have the most holy place. And uh, these are the furniture that was in there. This is exactly how it was set up. And we're going to get into all those. Remember the, the uh, altar, the labor, table of shoe bread. We also had, this is the veil that went in between. These are the veils. You have the golden lampstand, the altar instance in the middle, and then you had the Ark of the Covenant at the very end. But we're going to get into each, to each one in its meaning. We're going to break it down one by one. We just, this is just a little outlook of how it looked. And later on, David moved the Ark of the Covenant into the temple. So it was still set up just like this, but instead of using like tent stuff, because they were, they didn't, uh, they were using tents at first, but it went to a building. Same structure only went from the tent to the building, to the temple. All right. And that's, this is another picture right here. Just showing us just how it looked. Just to open how it looked. All right, sanctuary. Remember I told you, Psalm 77, 13. Your way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? The Psalm says that your way, O God, is in the sanctuary. God's way, the plan of salvation, is revealed in the earthly sanctuary. And notice it says earthly sanctuary. Because later on we're going to talk about. We're not going to talk about it right now. We're going to get, I want you guys to remember in your minds right now where this is going. The earthly sanctuary was a diagram of the sanctuary in heaven. A lot of people don't even know that there was a, there's, a, there's, a saint, there's a sanctuary in heaven. We're going to get into that a little bit later. That's awesome. Just keep that in mind. So what is sin? What is sin? Why did we need a sanctuary in the first place? It's because of sin. 1 John 3, 4. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. Romans 6, 28. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal and life. God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. When, as we talked about last week, when Adam and Eve sinned, the human race fell under the curse of sin. It fell. Satan had took dominion over this world. If you study the Bible, the Bible teaches that Satan took dominion over this world. He began to rule this world. And we had lost connection with our Father in heaven. But God had a plan. God had a plan for the human race. And he first presented that plan to Adam. After they got kicked to Adam and Eve, after they got kicked out of the garden, he showed them that plan. We're going to talk about that. But first, the whole purpose of God wanting to dwell amongst people because we lost connection with him. And when we're born, we're born in sin. Like, so literally everybody is a sinner. All of us is a sinner. You know, and let me give you an example. When a child you know, does something wrong. Say the child breaks something or does something wrong. Does that child have to learn how, from somebody how to lie? The child doesn't have to learn. The, the child literally, if you, if you look at most kids, they didn't, have, they didn't pick up lying from somebody else. They just somehow know how to do it. They could just, it's just automatically in their nature. Why? Because we have a sinful nature. We're born in sin. David said, behold, after he has sinned, when he had killed, you remember he had, uh, there's a story in the Bible where David had uh, a woman's husband killed so he could to try to cover up his sins from sleeping with her. And he said, created me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. And before that, he said that he was born and shaped in iniquity. He knew that he was a sinner. He knew that in his own strength, he, he couldn't do it. He had strong, sinful desires. It's in his human nature. It's in his human nature, and that's for all of us. That's why we do things. We, like, we, break, we naturally break God's law. We naturally break God's law. Our, it's, it's, it's in our nature. It's who we are as sinners. But God said, okay, I have a plan. I want to break you away from sin. God's plan was to break us away from sin to bring us back to him. That is the whole purpose of the sanctuary, to escape death. Because he said the wages of sin is death. And God said, okay. Because, you know, Satan told even the garden, he said, oh, you're not going to surely die. Don't worry about it. You're not going to die. You know, he tried to twist God. They didn't die immediately. No, they didn't. But they began to die. 
the human race, they began to just deteriorate. It, this wasn't the fact that they were just going to die that day, like some people think. Some people take that out of context. Over time, they began to die, and eventually they died because man was never meant to die. We wasn't supposed to die. God made us to live forever. We were supposed to live with him forever. We were supposed to be in connection with him forever. But Adam and Eve gave it up. And now everyone's suffering. Now everyone's suffering. Just like when we can make a mistake, there are times where we can make a mistake and everybody suffers for our mistake. But just by one decision, if I make a terrible decision, I can put my whole family in danger. Just by one decision I made. That's just the world we live in. That's just a sinful world we, we live in. And so God said, okay, the result of breaking God's law is death, but the gift of God is eternal in Jesus Christ our Lord. Literally, the whole sanctuary teaches us, it, 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 it talks about Jesus. We talked about that last week. The whole sanctuary is about Jesus Christ, of how he was going to get us back to our Father in heaven, how he's going to reconnect us, how he's going to give us that eternal life again. That's why he says eternal life in Christ Jesus. Because one day, we're going to talk about that. Because one day, we're going to talk about how, we're going to talk about how Christ defeated death. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about that, but not right now. But I'm just a little bit excited. I'm pumped because there's so much to talk about. Let's look at the courtyard. So what was the first thing in the courtyard? The altar of burnt offering, where animals were sacrificed, was located just inside its entrance. This altar represents the cross of Christ. The animal represents Jesus, the ultimate sacrifice. First John, uh, John 1, 29 says, when, Jesus, when John saw Jesus coming, he said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about because the altar, as you just seen that picture, was on the outside of it. Of, it was in the courtyard. It wasn't in the two buildings. It was right there in the courtyard. It was the first thing that you see when you walk in there. And that altar, we're going to talk about it uh, before we get into that. That altar, the center, what they would do is they would get a lamb. And the lamb that they would get, they had to pick out a lamb. The Bible teaches they had to pick out a lamb without spot or blemish. They had to pick out a perfect, or sometimes they used like bulls and all kinds of uh, stuff, but <laughs> all kinds of animals. But they had to take those animals, they had to lay their hands on it. They had to lay it, they had to confess their sins. And then the priest obviously would be there, the high priest. The high priest would be there because God has select different priests to help, you know, kind of like you have pastors and leaders and stuff now. God selected certain leaders to organize the whole thing, uh, to, to watch over the whole thing. And so what they would do is they'll kill the lamb. They'll kill the animal, uh, or the, they'll have the person kill the animal. And it was very bloody and disgusting. You know, I don't even want to think about it because I might throw up thinking about it. But literally what would happen was the sins that they had said, it would transfer to the animal. But the, the, the animal within itself, there was no meaning. It wasn't like they just, okay, my sins, I'm transferring to an animal. Okay, that's it, I'm good. No, God was trying to show them something. He was trying to teach them something. That lamb represented Jesus Christ. For a year, you can read in Isaiah, you can read in many books in the Bible. In the Old Testament, God had sent many prophets to prophesy concerning the coming Messiah. He, he had he, many signs and wonders that they were supposed to be awaiting for. They were supposed to be waiting for the, the Messiah. The Messiah was Jesus Christ. And since the beginning, back to right after Adam and Eve sinned, this whole plan of salvation was going. It just didn't happen when Moses brought, you know, the sanctuary just didn't come up with Moses. The Pope, the whole sacrificial thing happened way before that. Abraham did it. Isaac did it. Jacob did it. They all did it. <laughs> and the Lord, this is something that has happened. As soon as man fell, God presented this plan to Adam and Eve. So, and there was no such thing as Israel yet. So, so when people say, oh yeah, this was just for Israel, that's false doctrine. That's, that's false doctrine. The Bible clearly states, it clearly teaches us that the sanctuary was designed for all of us. He just selected them as to just be the light of the world. He, just like he gives us certain tasks to share with others, that was their duty. And they failed to do that in those days. And so we have a theological term for this, and it's called justification. It's called justification. Let's, let's read this. Righteousness through faith. The righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ. All who believe, there is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement. 
through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. Literally, they're telling us right here, the Bible is telling us in Romans that Jesus came to die for our sins. We were supposed to die. We were supposed to die. We were, we're not, we were supposed to be, literally, we're not supposed to have no connection with God ever. We're not supposed to. We're supposed to have been the ones that have died. We're not supposed to be here right now. We lost eternal life. We lost it. Adam lost it for the whole human race. Jesus came and said, okay, I'm going to give man that back. And we don't deserve it. That's why when we say we're saving the grace, talking about unmerited favor, that's what grace means. We don't deserve it. When you show someone grace, that person may not deserve your, that forgiveness. That person may not deserve mercy. We don't deserve it. But Christ did it anyway because he loved us. Let's see. It says here, according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood. And without shedding of blood, there is no remission. And that's why we celebrate communion. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for the remission of sins. Remission means the cancellation of a debt, charge, or penalty. That's what remission means. Jesus came and his blood was shed for the remission of sins. We do not deserve Jesus Christ. We don't deserve his sacrifice. But he did it anyway for us because he loves us. He gave us a chance. He said, okay, you guys messed up. And he demonstrated his love through the cross. God demonstrated his love through the cross. Because remember, we were talk, we're going to talk about this one day too. Where this is spiritual warfare. The battle is between God and Satan. Way back before Adam and Eve even existed, the Bible says war broke out in heaven. And the dragon fought against uh, he fought against God. He fought back against him. He tried to stand. He tried to over. Isaiah talks about he's, when he said, "Oh, Lucifer, how thou fallen from heaven?" He said, uh, "He said, I will ascend above the clouds. I will exalt my throne before the stars of God. I will be like the Most High." Lucifer was at war against God. He tried to, to tear down God's government to set up his own. Lucifer, the Bible says, he was full of pride. It was pride that caused him to fall. And the same characteristics that Satan had that caused him to lose his spot in heaven. And we don't know how long the rebellion was. God was so merciful. We don't know how long it was before he got kicked out of heaven. But the same characteristics that rose up in Satan is the same characteristics that rises up in us. Because we fell into sin, we became under control of Satan. We fell under the control of Satan. So we're born, we're born under the curse of sin. We're born under the control of Satan. But God says, okay, I'm going to break that. I'm going to break that power that the devil has over your life, over my life. I'm going to break that power. And that's why Jesus came. That is why he came. The remission of sins. He paid the debt that was ours. That is what Jesus did. He, and, and, and I'm telling you, when we, I hope one day I could do a sermon about the cross. Because the power of the cross is so devastating. When you really study the power of the cross, the agony and the pain that Jesus suffered, literally the, 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 the story is just so powerful. Jesus' whole life was just a ministry to us. And Jesus overcame everything that man failed to overcome so that we through him could overcome. That's why he came. He came to change our lives around, to show the world, to show the enemy, and all the, everyone else who's watching that his way is the one true way. His way is the best way. His way is true. And it's possible. It is possible to overcome sin. Jesus is the Lamb of God that take away the sin of the world. Jesus himself said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's why that's where faith comes in. We have to believe that when we confess our sins, we repent of our sins, we come to Christ and acknowledge who we are as sinners and say, Lord, I am a sinner in thy sight. But I don't want to be this way no more. Change me, Lord. I repent of my actions. I repent of my ways. We have to humble ourselves, understand that God is the creator. Pride keeps us from humbling ourselves. As humans, we don't like to admit when we're wrong. We don't. When we're, when, we're, when we're wrong about stuff, we don't like to admit it. We like to, oh, yeah, 
try to argue with people. We like to try to, we try to like to push the idea that we're always right. But our lives are very sinful. And it takes true power from God for us to humble ourselves. There are many men in the Bible and throughout all the ages that constantly hearts were hardened. They refused to humble themselves. Why? Because the, the thing that caused Lucifer to fall literally was pride. The Bible says six things I hate, but seven of them. The first thing he mentioned was a proud look because it was pride that caused Lucifer to fall. And he, that same pride is in us. That same pride is in us. We have so much pride at times that we don't like to, we don't like to humble ourselves and confess before our God, before our creator. We harden our hearts towards our creator. And some, at one point in my life, I used to think, well, if I just see God, I'll humble myself before him. I'll just, I'll obey him. But that's not true. The Bible says some have tasted the good and still turn away. Many people in the Bible had a relationship with God, and they still walked away. Still walked away. Satan easy snatched them up just that quick. They lost faith. They took their eyes off of Jesus Christ. Literally, the first decision that a Christian must make is that we have to accept Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. That is the first step of a Christian walk. That is the one main only thing that God asks us to do is to surrender our hearts to him. Lord, I am a sinner. I have sinned and I repent. Let your will be done in my life. Take over my life. That's what that means. Take over my life. Take control of my life. Since all of us have sinned, all of us have earned death. When Adam and Eve sinned, they would have died at once, except for Jesus, who stepped forward and offered to give his perfect life as a sacrifice to pay the death penalty for all his people. After sin, God required the sinner to bring an animal sacrifice. The sinner was to kill the animal with his own hands, what we just talked about. It was bloody and shocking, and it indebitably impressed the sinner with the solemn reality of his sins awful consequences, eternal death, and the desperate need of a savior and substitute. Without a savior, no one has any hope for salvation. The sacrificial system taught through the symbol of the slain animal that God will give his own son to die for their sins, as we just talked about. That is why they, God set up the sanctuary system. He wanted us to understand, he wanted us to see the plan of salvation. It wasn't just a physical thing that they were doing just to be doing it just because many other nations in the area they were doing all kinds of sacrifices sacrificing babies sacrificing all kinds of evil stuff things that god god had nothing to do with that they was they was sacrificing all these false gods and false system of worship god said okay i have to show you guys what it really supposed to look like this is not it the stuff that other people is doing was evil evil so the Israelites were not just doing this just to be doing it. They were doing this because God was trying to show them something in the rest of the world. He was trying to show men that we are not on this earth just to be here. We're not here just to have a jolly good time and fool around. Just look, oh, yeah, we're just here. I have no purpose. I, God has a purpose for humanity. He has a purpose for humanity. He has a plan for humanity. And humanity have forgotten that. That's why there's, the devil has set up so much doctrine, so much confusion. You come from monkeys, you come from this. Listen, that is so degrading. God said, I made man to be intelligent, awesome beings. We, the Bible said we were giants in all day. Our physical nature, the wisdom that we had, we were created unique. But all of a sudden, man would degrade himself into coming from an animal. To coming from an animal. God, God, God made us above the animals. We, we have been so degraded, and this is just what Satan has done over the years. This is what he's done. This is what he does. He hates the human race, and we fall right into his trap, and we think we be feeling, fulfilling our own purposes. We be thinking we're doing our own thing. In reality, man don't realize that we're under control of Satan the whole time. The whole time we're under control of Satan, and people are just like, we just like that today, and it's, and it's billions of people. Billions of people don't even know this. But God has been trying to, he has been reaching out to man for such a long time now, wanting to commune with his creation. He'd be wanting to talk to us, but we have a choice. God doesn't force himself on us. We have to wake up and say, okay, I want God in my life. We have to do that. That's one thing God never does. He gave us a freedom of choice. I used to ask, well, Lord, why does bad thing happen? Well, God gives us the freedom of choice. And sometimes as humans, we got to learn the hard way. 
That's why he, when they started to see this and they saw that they had to kill and all this stuff, I can't imagine how Adam and Eve felt when they started seeing the whole world go down after they sinned. Sometimes we have to see and learn the hard way for us to realize that this way was wrong. Because we're so stubborn. We're sinful. But God is so merciful that he's trying to teach us. We can mess up over and over and over again, and God is right there just to, okay, you messed up again. Matt, let me help you. Let me help you because you, you, you know, you out of control. That's how loving God is. That's his character. As you can see, this is just a picture of the altar, uh, the courtyard, what it possibly could have looked like. So many different pictures out there for it. Uh, but the real issue is, or the real focus is when you come to this, to this altar right here, you're coming to the cross. You're coming to the foot of the cross. The next thing that was in there was the labor. We saw that in the, in the, in the, in the, in the diagram. The labor was next. We're not going to go through all these tonight, by the way. This is the last one we're going to go through tonight. We don't have the time. And, and, and by the way, I could go on more about this, too. There's a lot more to that. I can go on about that. But we don't have the time. I just want us to get, I just, God just wants us to get just the ideal picture of the plan of salvation right now. That's what we're focused on. We get to our little details another time. <laughs> Baptism. What did the labor represent? Baptism. The labor located between the altar and the entrance to the sanctuary was a large wash basin made of brass. Here, priests washed their hands and feet before offering a sacrifice or entering the sanctuary. The water represents the cleansing from sin in the new birth. So the, we talked about the first step in Christianity. That's coming to the cross. Coming to Christ, surrendering, repenting, confessing our sins before God, not before man. Notice I said before God. It's one thing when we do stuff wrong, we apologize to each other. But there have been many doctrines that you may have run into where they tell you like, oh yeah, a priest or someone has some other man or somebody has the power to forgive your sin. No man on earth could ever, we could ever substitute as Christ did for our sins. No man has that power to say, okay, I forgive you for your sins. Nobody has that power to do that. Every man is a sinner. I can't come in here and tell people come, you know, some people, I've ran to people who really believe that they need to talk to me about their sins. I said, don't talk to me, man. <laughs> I'm not the guy to talk to. I'm a sinner just like you. You're talking to the wrong man. The man you need to be talking to is Jesus Christ. He's the only one, the only one who has the power to forgive sins. We don't have that power. We all need a savior. We're man. That's, we are man. Baptism, let's talk about it. He who believes is baptized and is baptized will be saved. But he who does not believe will be condemned. That's Mark 16, 16. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. There is only one true baptism. All other so-called ba baptisms are counterfeits. The word baptism comes from the Greek word baptisma. It means to dip under or submerge or immerse. So obviously in the, the sanctuary, they, they wash before they did the lamp thing, and then they wash also before they enter into the sanctuary. But the labor, as the Bible points out, represented baptism. John the Baptist and many others came and they, and they taught that. You have to be fully submerged when you get baptized. That's what happened in the Bible. Philip, many other disciples, Jesus himself, when they got baptized, they went down in the water and they came up. Why? Because it meant, to so talk about smirk, it meant to be just to be renewed, a newness of life. It's literally baptism, just when you get baptized, you're accepting the life, the birth, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So when you are, baptism is about being born again. It's about being, Jesus told Nicodemus, he said, well, how can you be born again? Do I go back in the womb and then come back out? He's like, what are you talking about, man? You can't go back in the womb and come back out. He was talking about spiritually. You have to be born again. That means a new life. God turns our life around. While we're going in this, this direction, we're headed towards death. God said, all right, stop. When you get baptized, you do a 180 to the newness of life. Brand new life. God begins to change our heart. He begins to change our mind, the way we think, the way we act. It can only be done through the power of the cross. 
Only Jesus can do that. That's why he had to come down. He had to be an example to show man what a righteous life looks like. We're going to talk about that later on, too, because that gets way more deeper. We're going to talk about that later on. But literally, God turned, when you get baptized, you're turning your life around. He said, Lord, I'm tired of being who I am. I want to be a new, a new man or a new woman in Christ, a new child in Christ. And so that's what was the representation of baptism. So when you see baptism, when people just throwing water in your head, and that's not baptism. That's not baptism. A lot of people don't like to look at the details. They say, oh, that stuff don't matter. Let me tell you something. When God instructs us to do something a certain way, he means it because it's a reason why he, he's telling us that. A lot of us humans, we, we overlook stuff. We be like, oh, we can just do whatever. But God, you can't just do whatever. Why? Because our life don't belong to him. Man. We, our, our lives don't belong to ourselves no more. When we surrender to God, now we got to learn to do things his way. Because when we're humans, we love to have control over things. We've had power over our lives for so long, and look where our lives have gotten us. Uh, when you give your life to Christ, the Lord said, okay, I'm in control of your life now because you gave me control. Unless you just tell him at some point, yeah, I, don't want control. I don't want you to have control of my life anymore, which would probably be the most biggest mistake in our lives. So I hope none of us do that. Still baptism. Repent and turn away from your sins and experience conversion. Acts 2, 28 says, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Acts 3, 19, repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be by literally changing your lifestyle. Before, you, like, and then this doesn't happen overnight because I just want to let, make that clear. When you get baptized, you're not just going to get up out that water and be like, all right, yes, I'm new already. Everything is perfect. I'm going to love people. I'm not going to hate people. I'm going to have the fruits of the spirit. I'm going to forgive people. I'm going to be kind to people. I'm going to be this. I'm going to be that. It don't work like that. It takes time. It's a lifetime experience. It, it could take weeks, months. Literally, God has to, it's to be that. You heard Kojo tell you, it is the beginning of the Christian journey. It's not the end. Some people think after you get baptized, that's it. The journey's over. Yes, I'm good. No. <laughs> it's a, you got to keep walking with the Lord. That's why he gave us the sanctuary, because you have to walk with God. Reason why God took Enoch to heaven in the Bible is because the Bible says Enoch walked with God. You have to walk with him. And when you walk with him, you don't stay the same. Because God is so righteous, it's impossible to stay the same. It's impossible. You can't be in the presence of a holy God and think that, okay, I'm going to stay the same. When you walk with God, he changes us. We become new creatures in Christ Jesus. That is the plan of salvation. The first step is to surrender, give your life to Christ, repent, and be baptized. Let's talk. Romans 6, 4 through 6. We were buried with him through baptism into death. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also shall walk in the newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should be no longer slaves of sin. A lot of people don't like to admit that part, but the Bible makes it very clear. We're slaves to sin. But when we are born again, that's why the Bible, why do you think Paul says so many times, Lord, uh, put away the old man and make me anew. I'm crucified with Christ. He was talking about himself. When the, the old sin's got to be done away with. God told Isaiah, wash, when he was telling to, giving the message to Isaiah to give it to the tree, he said, wash, make yourselves clean. Put away the evil of your doings before, before my eyes. So your sins uh, be like uh, scarlet, they'll be as white as snow. Many other scriptures in the Bible that points to the renewness of life, the washing, the cleansing through the blood of the Lamb, becoming a new creature in Christ. That means we got to, Lord God, we got to pray. We got to pray and ask God to, to help us stop doing things that he tells us is not good, especially things that are harmful for us. Sin is harmful to us regardless. But anything that God calls sin in the scriptures, and we do those things, we got to ask God to help us to stop doing those things because it's harmful to us. That is why we have to stop sinning because sin is going to lead us to death. The wages of sin is death. So anything that God tells us is wrong because it's harmful to us, even if we can't understand it, we pray and say, Lord, please give me understanding why is this harmful to me so I can stop doing it. Because sometimes we got to learn why before we can even stop doing it. 
And that means may even have to take the hard way. So many people in the Bible that they had to go through such a hard life for them to finally say, okay, Lord, I've had enough. I had enough. I realized that my way and the things that you said I shouldn't be doing, we should not be doing them. Because this is killing us. This is messing us up. This is destroying us. Look at the world around us today. We already see, we just prayed for some of the things. The war, the conflicts, the gun violence. This is what God's talking about. This is what he's talking about. Baptism, let's keep going. Baptism represents the believer uniting with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. This symbolism is filled with deep meaning. In baptism, the eyes are closed and the breath is suspended as in death. Then comes burial in the water and resurrection from the watery, gra the watery grave to a new life in Jesus Christ. Literally, when Christ died, that's why we have to live through Christ. Christ had to come and live a righteous life so we could live through him. So we can live through him. He, and literally, literally, what was the first temptation that caused uh, Eve and Adam to fall? It was the what? The, the fruit, right? Appetite. What did the devil try to tempt Jesus with in the desert? Appetite. Bread. Jesus overcame that. Adam and Eve felt Jesus passed it. Jesus, <laughs> what we couldn't do, Jesus did it all over for us. What we failed to do, he did it all over for us. So that when we live through him, we once again could be saved. God wants us in heaven with him. He has a place for us in heaven. And we're going to stop right there for this part because the rest of the stuff, it gets more deeper. It gets more awesome. And we haven't even, like I said, we, we're just cutting surface with some of these topics. We're just cutting surface. And also, one thing I want to mention is when we give our lives to Christ and surrender, we have to also have a knowledge and understanding of why we're making the decision. So that also means if you're like four years old, don't know anything that much yet, you're still learning, or you're a baby. Why is a baby getting baptized? Why is a two-year-old or three-year-old getting baptized? They don't have no understanding of, what, of why they're even getting baptized. You can't put a baby in the water and say, okay, I'm gonna baptize, I'm gonna have this baby baptized for this baby's sins. You can't do that. That baby has to grow up and make the decision for him or herself. We think we be thinking we can substitute and save people. That's not our job. That's God's job. That's Jesus' job. That's why he came. That's his job. Our job is all, we could be a light to other people and lift them up. He said, Jesus said, if you lift me up, I will draw all men unto me. We can lift them up in the way we live our lives the way we talk to people, the way we act, but we cannot substitute and, and make decisions for other people. It doesn't work like that and think that that person's going to be saved because that person's not going to be saved that way. That individual, every single one of us have to answer for ourselves. It is a decision that each and every person have to come to. We can accept the gift. Jesus said, I have a place, I go prepare a place for you. He said, there are things in the paradise of God Great and mighty things we know it's not. God has things ready for us that we can't, we don't even know right now. We can't even comprehend. He says, I have a whole, a whole eternal life of just paradise waiting for us. And I'm telling you, if you're on the other side, the Bible makes it very clear. There's no victory on the other side. So for some people, it's like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm okay with, you know, not accepting Christ and all that stuff. The Bible makes it very clear. There's going to be weeping and well as a gnashing of teeth. People are going to regret the day they chose to rebel against God by their own choice by their own choice. And we're going to talk about that later too because this is so much to talk about. I love the Bible. The whole Bible, it is a manual, a blueprint. It is our guide to heaven. Literally, it's our guide to heaven. And I get excited talking about it because I know as a young man, I became a believer in Jesus Christ because I started to understand the hope that he has for my life. I started to realize, because I hated life at one point. I was suicidal and everything. I hated life. I, didn't wanna, I did not want to be here. I said, there's no reason for me to be here. I try to find every excuse of why not to be here. But God had to remind me, I have a plan for your life. He had given me hope. He gave me a purpose. He gave me a reason to be here. He gave me understanding of what all this means, why I'm here, what's happened. 
And he says he just has such a blessed hope for all humanity if we just give ourselves to Christ and let him take over our lives. If we let him take over, he would do the rest. He would do the rest. And I just want to leave us with that thought tonight as you close. So our people online as well, 727. I got done just in time. <laughs> and I was here at 630. <laughs> I was early. Uh, so praise God for that. But I just want us to really think hard because now we're digging deep into the meat of the world, the meat of the word. Now this is Bible study right here. And that's why I encourage like to go home and read the Bible for yourselves. Don't don't just take my word for it. I mean, obviously, I showed you the scriptures and things like that. But go and look at it for yourself, because it's, it's not enough for you to go somewhere else and say, well, my pastor said back there that Jesus. Uh, no, don't say what I said. Say because the Bible said because God spoke to you tonight. That's why you tell somebody else. Don't tell me because I said it, because I'm nobody. I'm just a regular guy trying to do God's work. We all are. And so many people have gotten so confused because of that, because they have just listened to what other people say. But literally, our growth is, 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 is us between us and God. It's between us and God. No one can, can, can come in between that and be like, okay, well, you know, I could. No, we have to make that decision for ourselves. And we're going to talk about even more of the sanctuary. That is the first step. And that's why we're here. So that being said, let's bow our heads and close our eyes. And you guys can get up out of here. <laughs> All right. Father God in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to study your word, Lord, because we are studying, really studying your word. We're not here for show. We're not here to play games. We're not here just to be here. We're here because we want to learn of you, want to know who you are, and we also want to learn to live the way Christ lived on earth. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful and thankful for the plan of salvation that you have given us, Lord, the gifts, the sacrifice in which you have just such an awesome sacrifice that our minds can't even comprehend as to even the height of the love that you have for us as to why you did this for us, Lord. We are so grateful because we are undeserving. We are all sinners in your sight, all of us, and we are in need of a Savior. And Lord, you just, as you read all the problems in the world, the things that are happening in our life, the things that we're going through, we just pray in the name of Jesus that you take control of our lives and have your way in our lives so that we can have a testimony to share with other people so we can testify of what you've done for our lives through the power of your word and lift your name up because you said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Let us not live our lives for ourselves, but live our lives for you because you gave the greatest sacrifice that no one could ever, ever give us. So as a, just a response, you want us to give us, you want us to give us your, uh, our lives to you, Heavenly Father. So, Lord, we're just praying, Lord, each and every day, teach us to sacrifice, teach us to give our lives to you, teach us to walk with you every single day and to have your character, to reflect your character. And we'll be careful to give you the praise, honor, and glory, protect us as we go home tonight and for the rest of the week. In Jesus' name, amen.